Yo, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Raw Faith. Today, me and P-Dog, we're getting real with you guys. And we have prepared some questions for each other. We have no idea what those questions are. And they are faith or pretty much growth oriented, I guess you could say. Uh, and yeah, so we're about to hear three questions live for the first time that we set up for each other. And I think it's going to be pretty fun. So hopefully some uh, great stuff comes of this. I don't know what episode number it is, but we're here. We're riding. It's got to be like 15 or so. You think so? For sure. No doubt. Oh, man. You got any, uh, any coffee going down over there? I've got nothing, man. I, I looked in the fridge. No kefir, no kombucha. So I got a little lime and salt water. That's Jeez. it. I got some uh, BPN Reds and creatine. All right. You got a big run today? No. Big run. What? No. Fueling up. No way, Jose. <laughs> With what? The Reds? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. No, no, no. It's like a daily, it's like a daily thing you take. I'm only taking it because they sent it to us for free because we ordered stuff for our marathon. They sent us the stuff for free because they're they're promote. It's a new product. They're doing these little to go packages of reds and greens instead of just the big tub of the powder because you can't take it to go. You got to put it in the Ziploc. So they're trying to promote the little to go packs. So they're sending it out to free, free to everyone who orders right now. Cool. Yeah, it sounded like a plug. I'm sure. It's what happened to me. <laughs> so, but let's uh, let's get into it. I'll I'll let you go first since it seems you got more questions than me. So maybe we can, like you know, stagger me in the middle of you. And, I don't know, catch uh, a question or two on either side. I mean, I've got I've got my three that I want to ask. I've narrowed it down. All right, all right. Well, then you want me to go first, huh? No, it's it's cool. I'll all right. um, let her I'll eat. start. So, um, I'm curious. You've taken many big leaps in your life, um, you know, from not taking the college route to starting Elevate to moving to Florida from Indiana to now being in Colorado, moving there um, and and having a very successful re- relationship there. Uh, many big leaps. I'm curious, what is your take and how do you feel when you like, how do you know when God is calling you to to take a big leap like that yeah man that's a great cue great cue um how do i feel when god is calling me to a big leap i I think for me a big one has been affirmation through the people closest to me um and the reason i say that one is from the move from indiana to florida in terms of like my family it made zero sense I was living with my grandpa at the time. You know, he's getting older, but he was living his best life with me out there, uh, you know, helping him out. People were saying I was taking years off of his life. So in terms of like serving my family from that front, it didn't make sense. And then my mom, she had just lost her sister um, to a stroke and all kinds of different health issues, um, which was a very just you know, a sister laid in the hospital bed, my aunt laid in the hospital bed for, for four months with half of her skull taken out. Like it was just a, just a gruesome, you know, time really. Um, uh, and my mom is a sing, eh, not necessarily, she's a single mother. Um, my little sister's dad is still in the picture. So whatever you want to say there, but pretty much takes care of my sister by herself. So my mom was really going through a bit of a hard time. Um, you know, slipped into a, uh, a depression. Um, and so I was doing a lot for my little sister too, taking her to school, making her breakfast, things like that. So the move from Indiana to Florida didn't make sense. And I actually, uh, very emotionally unintelligent of me didn't tell my family and then extended family came to the funeral and just started asking about my life. Well, I ended up, you know, spilling the beans to them like, Hey, I'm about to move to Florida in like 20 days or something. Mm-hmm. So my, my mom and Grandpa found out at my uh, aunt's funeral, their sister and daughter's funeral. And um, 
So yeah, like, like I said, from a family perspective, it didn't make sense at all. But after I just had the vulnerable conversation with both of them, I talked to my mom very deeply. We cried for three, four hours. My mom said like, you know, we don't want you to go, but we know that it's best, what's best for you. Mm. And that was, you know, when the person that you're helping the most says that, the person that you're staying for the most says that, um, which was my mom at the time, like, it's like, all right, that's, you know, this is a pretty good sign from God. The person that I am claiming to stay here for is telling me it's in my best interest to leave. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a big sign, just, just affirmations through others. And, and I feel like I had done the move out of the hometown thing before I moved to Florida. And I moved back to my hometown um, to be able to just take a load of expenses off, quit my job and, and start Elevate. Um, so I had seen the growth of just periodically moving out of my hometown, even if that I was 90 minutes away, two hours away. I can't imagine the growth if I'm moving across the country to a place like Florida, who has that has a network, um, you know, of, of entrepreneurs and really good friends of mine. Like, I just knew there was going to be so much growth. And like I just know God is not against growth. <laughs> if that if that makes sense, it is pretty clear. Like, God was not going to be against me moving to two of my best friends to, to live in close proximity with them who are devout in their faith. Like, I knew I was going to be sharpened by them and grow so much closer. And I mean, as soon as I moved, like you were around during that time, like, man, I had six to eight Bible studies on my calendar, like was all in on God. As soon as I moved, I finally got the space. Um, for me. And, and I don't think people realize that when they are living in their hometown or living in a place they've always lived, what happens is you fall into a lot of ruts, traditions, you fall into these relationships, you kind of get complacent in your relationships. And what happens is you're just kind of on autopilot with a big percentage of your life, because it's just the things you do. Like for me, I just ate dinner, watched a movie with my grandpa. Like, time is awesome. Don't get me wrong. I try to soak it up and be as intentional as I could. But when you yep. go from living in Indiana, having all this family around that's demanding of your time, you know, my mom needed a lot of help. Grandpa needed a lot of help. Dad, other siblings, like stuff like that. I move across the country. Guess what? No one is longer demanding of my time. So I got all of my time mm. up to me of where I'm going to spend it. Um, and I think that that was just insanely fruitful season down there in Florida because I just, like I said, I had every single waking second up to me to how I choose I was going to spend it. And quite frankly, chose to put a lot of that time into my relationship with God, into the business, uh, and had the people around me doing the same thing. So that made it very easy. So yeah, I think long story short there, people really affirmed it. Uh, and I knew it was just so blatantly clear how much growth was going to come from it. And I just, I just know God is, is not against that growth. So that's good. Did you consult with like any fellow believers before you made the decision? Just curious. Um, I mean, really everyone I talked to was a fellow believer, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, I mean, like consult, not not necessarily. Like I, I think the people who I was talking to, you know, Mitch, who was out in Colorado at the time, um, Joey, like these people who I was talking to, like they had made big moves themselves too. So sure. it was like no brainer from their end of like, I've moved to Florida, I've moved to Colorado, you know, like there's so much fruit in moving away out of the hometown. Like, again, no brainer of how much growth is going to come from this. Like you need to do this. And that's exactly what my mom and, and grandpa said, like same thing. And they're, you know, they're not believers. Like, so well, I take it back. My mom is a believer, but, um, uh, you know, they're, they're not like, they weren't thinking about the walk with God. You know, they're thinking about if you move across the country and are able to go do like, live your life and support yourself with your own business. Like you're going to grow so much from that. And my grandpa, like he's got an experience and memory from everywhere 
the dude's been absolutely everywhere. It's crazy. And so he knows, you know, the, the memories and the experiences and how important they are. And so he was like, yeah, like, you got to go live this life. You got to see what it's got in store for you. So. So cool. Appreciate you sharing. Yeah, absolutely. Guess it's uh, my turn. Yeah. Man. I don't know which one to start with here. I, I do got them in order. Um, I got one that's, that's pretty deep. So I'm going to start with one that's not so deep. Still deeper, but warm up. So. One big question I got, and this this may be honestly a question for your parents, <laughs> but I, I think you'll be able to to really, um, you know, answer that question. But how did your parents raise you to really respect their faith? And this is a two part question. Um, so what I mean by this is I've had countless conversations with people who have grown up, seen you know, their parents are believers. They've grown up in a family of believers, whatever that looks like. And they've just seen nothing but hypocrisy. You know, like I see how God says to live and I see how behind the curtain, like the sin and how my parents are living. And it's turned a lot of people away from faith. They weren't able to adopt that faith on their own. So you, on the other hand, and that's kind of my second part, is how did this become your own, which we can get to that. But you, on the other hand, like you are very admirable of your parents' faith. You you really grew up with a respect for their faith. And I can just see that for their beliefs and their values. So, you mm. know, like what did your parents do differently for you to not necessarily rebel from their beliefs, but almost inherit their beliefs? Um, That's a great question. I like that a lot. I'm going to split this question up into two parts. I'm going to say before my brother passed away and after. Mm -hmm. um, so before my brother passed away, first 13 years of my life, um, it was more just to respect because I respected them deeply, you know, across the board. Um, that's just how I was raised to respect my parents and whatever they said to do. How do you... How do you think that was like, what did, what do you feel they did specifically to really cultivate that respect? <laughs> I, um, let's see. <laughs> yeah. Cause you know, a lot of parents don't cultivate that. Like that's a big thing. Like people hitting their, you know, 13 and hitting this rebellious phase where it's like, I don't want anything to do with my parents. Um, I think I respected my parents. Um, so, you know, I kind of relate, but my parents didn't have those, those strong beliefs that got passed down to me. Yeah. They had some sort of values that got passed down, hard work and things like that, but I didn't inherit faith from them. So I was curious how you feel the respect was cultivated. My respect for my parents alone, I think was cultivated in a unique way just because they were so young when they had me. Um, and it, it was just, it was a unique dynamic because my, my mom was 19 when I was born. My dad was 20, but we just, ha we had such a great relationship. I just remember growing up having such a great time. Like all, any time that I had with my parents was such, such fun. Mm -hmm. Um, th so that we had a great relationship. And then also I saw how hard they worked. Uh, my mom going through nursing school early on, becoming a successful nurse. Um, my dad, you know, coming up from basically nothing in his past and his childhood to, you know, being a Marine and working extremely hard, in the job that he had. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess I just saw that, um, and respected them because of that. Mm -hmm. And then because I respected them, I respected their faith and what they told me to follow at the time. Um, because I mean, it, it wasn't my decision. Like, the principle that they lived by was when you're under this household, you know, you're going to come to church with us. You're going to, you're going to go to church. You're going to go to Sunday school. Um, and until you move out, then you can go do what you want, but this is how we're <laughs> going to, this is what we're going to do here. Yeah. Um, and I really didn't ever see it as any other, any other choice. Um, so for the first 13 years, it was, more just me kind of following along and just 
following the path that ultimately had been set before me. Um, and then my little brother, he got diagnosed with cancer, uh, little brother Cooper, and ended up passing away. And I've told this story many times already for those listening. Um, but the day he passed away uh, and throughout his whole time battling cancer, I, I just saw my parents lean on God during that mm-hmm. time. Um, and even on the day he passed, like my dad turned on worship music um, in the hospital room and on the way home. And um, I, I saw them lean on God during that time and saw the fruits um, of their faith, just how joyful they were despite the chaos. And that's when I really began to explore this faith on my own and, and really have a deeper respect for it. Mm. Love that. You kind of answered two of my questions there. Um, <laughs> Both of them out. No, no, no. I, I'm saying like the, you answered the two-parter in, in one of the questions I had. Um, oh, so. It's all right. I'll, I'll cultivate something else real quick, <laughs> but we'll pass the ball over to you. I got you. Um, all right. So this may get a little deep here. We'll see. Last spring slash summer, you committed to um, abstaining from sex until marriage. And it's been about a year, maybe a little more now. And I'm curious, two things. What has been the hardest part of that commitment? And what has been like the biggest blessing, like the most fruitful part of it? Mm -hmm. The hardest part, not having sex. (laughs) (laughs) Um, By no means is it easy. Uh, I just want to throw that out there. I feel like when I made the decision, and I know many um, guys around me who have made the decision, I feel like when I made the decision, I thought it was like a uh, on-off switch. Um, like, And I think we think about this with sin a lot. I think it's like, you know, God is convicting me to make this decision of of not having sex. God is convicting me of whatever. And it's like, God, when I'm ready, I will commit to that. But until I'm ready, I can't commit to that because I know I'm going to make the mistake. Like, does that make sense? So it's like, yeah, like, God, you convicted me to not to make the decision to not have sex. Once I feel ready for that, like, then I will answer that conviction with my commitment. And that's just not how it works. Um, how it works is God convicts you, you commit right there. Yep. Guess what? You're going to stumble either way, either route you try to go, you're going to stumble. If you wait until you're ready, you'll probably never be ready. Um, so you eventually you're going to commit without being ready in the first place and you're going to stumble and make mistakes. Or if you commit on the spot when you felt convicted, maybe a lot harder to commit when you know you're not ready, mm. but you're going to stumble, uh, both ways. And so I feel like with sin, we almost have this thing like, God, I can't promise you that yet. Like, let me work on that kind of behind the scenes before I make that commitment so I can kind of (laughs) sin without feeling so bad and kind of, you know, ease into it. But like all the sin has the consequence the same, regardless of if you've committed to God that you're not going to do it or not. Mm -hmm. Like he's expecting you to not sin, regardless of if you feel ready to or not. Like that's just so. I know for me, like it it was kind of one of those things where I didn't necessarily say like, I'm going to wait and make that commitment. But I know a lot of guys like they like try to wait, make this commitment. And then they think it's just going to be this. Okay. Once I'm committed, it's easy. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm committed in this. Like I made this decision. I said it out loud. Saying it out loud does hold a lot of power. Sharing it with your friends holds a ton of power for sure. But by no stretch is it easy. And so for me, the hardest part is I got this commitment. Now I got to lead a relationship without, you know, sex. That's how I've done relationships up until this point, you know, in my entire life. How do you lead a relationship without that? Like yeah. It's just something almost like relearning a relationship and not turning to that um, during struggles. You know, you realize when you're standing from sex, it makes God makes it so clear as to why he puts it that way why that's why it's a thing because when there are struggles friction like the the first innate thing human nature is to turn physical yeah we can solve this if we just get intimate physically 
we're struggling, for arguing, whatever, you know, makeup sex. It's obviously coined a term for a reason. Like you ain't making anything up. You're just having sex. It's like mm. you're just putting a bandaid over a bullet hole. And so, um, you know, and that's a very hard thing not to do when that's what you've done in the past relationships. So that is probably the hardest thing. Um, and by no means when I committed, have I just been seamlessly, you know, following the Lord and perfect, man, I'm yeah. a sinner just like everybody else. You know, I need God's grace just like everybody else in abundance, man. But it's definitely way better than it was when I first made the commitment. Now, like I've grown so much through that uh, in my ability to just uh, have, I guess, dominion over lust, um, yeah. I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, greatest thing that's come from it has been, like I said, I think that control and discipline over lust, I think is a really big one. Uh, if we want to talk about discipline, I don't think there's any greater discipline than over your own body um, and sexual desire. I don't think eating is harder. Working out is not harder. Anything. I think the hardest one from my experience, I think that it was even harder, maybe harder than overcoming porn. They're kind of one in the same, though. Um, you know, it's all feeding that same demon, I feel like. So I think the greatest discipline is that. Um, next thing I would say that one of the biggest things that's come from it is, you know, in my relationship, like if you're not having sex to cover up those bullet holes, guess what? <laughs> you got some exposed wounds, you know, like better get ready, strap in and figure out how you're going to pursue each other, how you're going to make each other feel loved without, you know, getting intimate and getting sexual. Um, so you had to communicate like that's the first and foremost you got to communicate uh so much and you got to be willing to just sit in that fire and communicate through it um and then i think in other pieces you got to find other ways to serve and, and show your love you know you got to be doing the little things like the details are the biggest thing um like for for my relationship specifically like tawny just really admires like quality time in a clean space and she can't have the quality time until we have a clean space. So it's like, if I can't do something as small as dinner was just done, she can't sit and relax and have that quality time that she loves the most until the dishes are done, until mm -hmm. dinner is all cleaned up and the kitchen is clean. So it's like, if I can just jump in and help with that, or if I can even be proactive, you know, in, in creating a clean environment so that we can have the quality time, like something so small like that. It's yeah. just such a, a deep thing of love. Like she'll get on these calls, um, you know, Bible studies and whatnot inside her community. And if she can come out of that and the kitchen is clean, place is cleaned up, she can just go straight into quality time. And that's a big, you know, she's extremely grateful for that. So that's a, just a small example of something I've learned in my relationship. But you got to find those like little things that we admire as people um, mm. that really show like, hey, I put in the effort and I was thinking about you because I love you. And like, you have to continue to do those. And I'm just, I can't imagine what happens when you have just a relationship built on that instead of, of the sexual, I mean, lust. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it gives you so much advantage going into marriage, like having abstained from sex, you know, all of the other connection points, including God, which is the main connection point should be in the relationship. Yeah. And then you can just add in, you know, sex on top of it. Like I'm, I'm sure that's extremely fruitful. I'm not in that season yet. So I don't know, but I mean, it doesn't make sense. Like you said, why God, you know, tell us to do this. Yeah. And I think, uh, I love what you're saying about God being a connection point. Like one, I don't know how relationships do it without God. They don't. <laughs> the reason divorce rates are so high um so and two like i i just i guess it's the same point as one but I, I can't imagine not having god to come to um and that's why i keep telling people like it makes sense as to why the bible says we should not be unequally yoked we should not have a partner that doesn't equally believe in god in my opinion because with the struggles we faced if she didn't respect my faith and have that faith of her own to where she she it, it's like 
it, it's just like the the any argument, any biblical argument. Like if bad things, if God is real, why do bad things happen to good people? You know, I I gave an answer to that question all from theology, all from the Bible. Yeah, I went through the Bible and gave biblical truths. Well, if someone doesn't believe in that wholeheartedly like I do, if that's not their truth above all else, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I say from the Bible if they don't believe in that. And if it's not, it has to be, I think, they're first and foremost. Because if it's not, then they will still put the struggle or put the friction or whatever it is or their emotions, their desires above that. If it's not their number one, like God is not their number one in the Bible and his word is not their number one, everything else can remain above it. And For sure. there's just no way you can go through a relationship from my perspective without having something that is above our struggles, without having something that is above our emotions and our desires, something that we can both point to and say, we can put ourselves aside for this. We can take all of this garbage and give it to this because this is above being God. God is above all of everything we got going on. God's got so much more in store than what we're currently facing and currently struggling with. And I, I just couldn't imagine if I had nowhere to, to let go with that stuff. I, I just feel like you would feel so stuck, so mm. much weight. Because it, it, what it does is it, it allows you to... It allows you to take all that that past, that mistake you just made, that hurt or that w whatever it was. It allows you to omit that, like get rid of that past and that regret and that weight and that friction that that past mistake is calling. You're not omitting the lesson to learn for the future. You're able to omit like, hey, I can give you some forgiveness because God has given me forgiveness so we can take the lesson from this. Did you learn your lesson that I want the kitchen clean? Like, you know, whatever it is, did you learn your lesson from that? And then you're able to operate out of a future place of like, here's what God has in store for us. And there's just so much fruit to be gained from being able to operate out of that future place of like, God has this in store for our relationship. We can work through this right now because we just omitted the weight and gave it to him. We learned the lesson from it. Boom, moving forward. So good. I love that. Can't imagine. All right, I guess it's my turn, huh? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I got a question in the name of humility. Well, let me let me just ask this question. You you, you answered it, but you may have answered it because I already know you. And I you know, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. number one question I had was how have you remained faithful through losing your little brother? I, I mentioned it earlier. And it, it was because of community. It was simply because of the people around me. Um, I saw how they leaned on God, um, particularly my parents. And, you know, we had close friends who um, visited my brother in the hospital weekly while he battled with cancer, um, family as well. And um, before any of the groups left, they they prayed. We got in the big mm. circle and we prayed. Um, my parents yeah. praying every single night before I left the hospital. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, my dad turning on worship music the day that my little brother passed away in the hospital room. I, I simply saw the other people do it and the, the fruit that they got from it and the joy that they found in the chaos. Um, and I, I didn't see any other way. I was like, all right. Me sitting in my sorrows is clearly not working throughout, you know, his battle with cancer. And even when he passed, he said, this looks like the only way. So I, I followed that. Yeah. Um, to answer your questions, it was ultimately just the people around me, community, my yeah. parents. They meant to that, man. I think, uh, I, I don't know if you read my, my email yesterday. I did. I meant to text you. Yeah. Um, and I basically answered that question in my email. Uh, so I just pulled it up. I, I just wanted to uh, read what I wrote completely from my perspective. Because um, I think it I think it pertains. I think it appeals to this. And I think it's a good just lesson to share on this episode. Uh, so my whole like notion of this email, if you guys aren't subscribed to the newsletter, I don't know what you're doing. Uh, 
But the whole notion of this email was God can only use what you give him. And, you know, Peyton lost his little brother and him and his family have just completely given it to God to use for good. And I think it's it's like Peyton said, because of community, but it's because everything had pointed back to God. And I'll, I'll just read what I wrote because I feel like I uh, Please do. did it best in the email. But <laughs> said my business partner, Peyton, lost his four-year-old brother, Cooper, to a rare form of brain cancer, a devastating event that is now being used for so much good. So the Bible tells us God uses all for th- all things for good. And I quoted the scripture, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. I said, as Cooper, Peyton's brother was lying in the hospital bed, paralyzed, battling cancer for months on end. Peyton's family turned to their church community, turned to prayer, turned to worship. Ultimately, every avenue pointing, turning toward God. Hmm. Months of battling. End with Cooper passing, a moment we may never know why God didn't intercede and heal the young boy. But what we do know is that Peyton's father, John, filled that empty hospital room car ride home with worship music blasting through the radio. John ultimately filled it with God, Peyton's dad. So also what we do know is that Peyton's family has since used Cooper's testimony to fundraise thousands of dollars for children with brain cancer via baseball tournaments and other organized events. More importantly, they have used this tragic death of Cooper to point thousands and soon to be millions toward God. And I just shared that because, you know, the the subject of of God can only use what you give him. Like you guys have just completely taken this tragedy and just given it to God and, and you've been able to remain faithful. You've been able to remain joyful and just, just, Take that sorrow, that grief, and, you know, you still go through it, don't get me wrong, but you've been able to just remove that weight and continue moving forward and, and having a vision for Cooper's life, even though he's not here. Like, and it's, it's just so apparent to see why that is. It's like literally in the storm, every avenue that came across your guys', you know, struggle inside that hospital room pointed toward God. And you know, here we are today. So I just thought it was, it was a good question to ask here today. And you kind of answered it in my first one, but yeah. And then I went on to talk about our man, Austin, <laughs> what a freaking legend, man. I'll post, I'll post it on Twitter. Uh, post that uh, email on Twitter, but yeah. So if anybody's not subscribed, get subscribed, <laughs> but you can go check it out on Twitter too. I'm sure. Yeah. <sighs> Man. Well. Curious, but before we, before we change that note, curious, like, you know, maybe somebody's listening to this and they experienced uh, an event like you have. Like, does that event, how does that event still play out in your mind today? You know, like, is there still a struggle around it? Is there still question marks around it? Um, is it just completely like, nope. Like this is this is going to be used for the glory of God. Like, I guess just like what does it look like today when you know I, I know like his name gets mentioned or you see something that that points you to him and it's still an emotional thing that brings about tears. So like, just curious, like what's the thought process going through your mind there? Like, I guess how do you remain faithful? I know like what kind of gave you the the cornerstone of seeing everyone else remain faithful, but yeah, you know, I'm sure there's still like. Speed bumps at times with it, of I'd course. imagine. You know, so yeah. I guess like what what is the what goes on there? Yeah, I mean, we're all going to have those times, despite the countless amount of social proof that God gives us that He's working. <laughs> we're still going to have those speed bumps that we get tripped up on, where we're like, ah, I don't really know if this is true. I don't really know, you know, if God was working through this, um, and you know you'll get caught in those, in those ruts. As soon as you turn back to the word, turn back to prayer, you know, turn back to fellow believers, community around you. Um, it's just undeniable that God works and, and mostly through reflection of how God has worked, you know, after Cooper passed away, just like you mentioned, um, my parents were able to, to host many events like baseball tournaments and, and other events like that. 
um, to bring awareness to his name. Um, they were able to, we were able to speak at several different churches um, in this area to share his story. Um, and then just the many people who drew closer to God during that time and even found their faith um, because of Cooper's testimony. When I, when I reflect back on that, um, it's, it's undeniable that, that God mm-hmm. was working. That's good. That's good. All right. We'll swing it your way. Thank you. Yeah. Oh man. Um, I, I had, I had the question that I wanted to say, but another one popped up. Um, mm. This is more of a fun question. It's not as not as deep, but here we go. We'll say it anyways. Do you ever foresee yourself being a pastor? Why or why not? Dude, the amount of times I've gotten this is wild. People want to know. I feel like people are telling me like I should and, and all this <laughs> stuff. Um, no, I, I don't. I don't. Right now, no. Um, you know, I don't know what God has in store, so I'll never say never. I'll I'll leave forever to God, but. I definitely salivate at the thought of being on a stage speaking to thousands. Um, That excites me a lot. I vision that very frequently, very often. Um, Public speaking is something I absolutely love. Is it easy? No, like it's, it's definitely, there's nerves around it, but I don't think I have as big of a barrier to entry as most. (laughs) I feel like I've, I've been, pretty good at getting up in front of people and talking. Um, and I love it. I absolutely love it. So I, yeah, I see many stages in my day ahead, Lord willing. Um, I don't know if that will ever be like a, a dedicated church, you know, that I've built, put together or what I, I could definitely see a guest speaking thing at multiple churches across the country and different stuff like that. Uh, I, I don't know if I'll ever like plan a church and like, you know, be a pastor of a church, yeah. I guess. So, but who knows? Maybe, uh, maybe God's got something else in store, man. That would be a good time. You know? Yeah. We'd be having a good time. It. And there's been many guys saying like, I should elevate church. When's it happening? Or I should start, uh, putting out some elevate Sunday sermons or something. Oh man. Like, I'm like, man, that's a full time job, you know. <laughs> there we go. So well yeah, I mean I don't know, dude, but I, I do feel God uh like really prepping me right now. And I'm sure he's gonna prep me for a very long time with this, but like I I don't know what what moment cultivated this, but I just felt there's there's a time where I felt God calling me to war. But I, I, he felt, I felt it was calling me to more understanding, more getting into his word and understanding. Um, and so that's why, like, right now, I've, I've re, just re going through the gospels because I think that, you know, arguably, let's say 80% of what someone's going to share is going to come from there. I don't know the percentage, you know, but if you're going to, transform someone's life it's probably going to be from the life of jesus i'd imagine um so that's why i'm just going back through there just trying to be as as diligent as possible in that reading so i do feel god just calling me to continue to grow in my understanding which you know he's calling everyone to that but i feel like it's it's for something big um to continue to share like in writing these emails has been a blast, you know, putting out like three to five emails every single week of just what I'm reading. So it's like when you're and we're doing these episodes too. So when you're reading to teach, it's a whole nother layer of uh intentionality with it. So that's why I love it so much too. So we'll Soak see, man. Up. Soak more of that up from the Bible. Yeah. Question. Uh, I got I got two now because I came up with one because I thought I was going to have to call it an audible. But I I put down here two words. I put humility sauce. <laughs> so I'll elaborate for the people. <laughs> uh, I think Peyton is arguably the most humble man I've ever met. And he's got so much potential. I've even argued he's too humble at times. 
Um, and I've tried to cultivate a little bit more ego out of him, I guess, is the best way to put it. But um, just, dude, I, you know, and, and it, it's so funny because I, I text you and I'm like, what are you learning about? Like, I texted you like yesterday, I think, maybe. I don't know, maybe two days ago, probably yesterday. And you're like taking the lower seat of the table. I'm like, oh my God, man. Like, you've been doing that, bro. Like, uh, I literally wanted to respond like, bro, like, I think you're good. Like, I think you're going to move on from that one. Like, like I think God has got you right with that one. Um, but you still continue to to strive for that. And and even though I, I think it's, it's probably your greatest strength, uh, humility. So curious just how is it cultivated and i i guess why are you still so focused on it um cultivated through it was cultivated just i mean i I was born and raised in the south man just a good (laughs) old southern boy you know it's came with the many principles that my my parents taught me um just remain humble particularly my dad Growing up in the church, him particularly, like that was one of the things that that um, stuck with him, and so he passed that along to me as well. Um, and just the more I remained humble throughout, you know, my early childhood through teenage years, and just saw the fruits from it. Um, I, I mean, social proof. I just wanted to stick with it. Uh, so, I guess that's why. I'm I'm humble today. Um, why I continue to pursue it? I mean, I find out more ways every day that that I'm selfish. Um, you know, yesterday I was just reflecting on different relationships that I have, um, and several people like I I tell them I'm going to pray for them, but I I hadn't prayed for them yet, and I had been bringing my own problems to God first um, before I even thought about any other prayers uh, of these other people that I said I was going to pray for. And so that just kind of hit me like a brick and, and um, was like, all right, there's more work to be done um, with, with humility. I, there's always, uh, always room to be more humble. So um, yeah, I mean, to answer the last question, I mean, it's done me so much good already. I'm just going to continue to pursue Double it. Down. I guess. Yeah, for sure. Uh, bro, you, you got to start using this thing, man. <laughs> I do. You're right. Prayer journal. So this is a little pocket notebook. I'm doing this for the people. Uh, I used to do the same thing. And, and I even like have neglected this thing, even since I bought it with the intention of, of using it. But I used to do the same thing as in telling people I'll pray for them. And then not, and I'd feel like a freaking heap of garbage for not. <laughs> um, and so what I did is I just ordered this little pocket notebook. And for a long time, I, I didn't use it as much as I said I was going to use it. Um, but now I've started using it. And I've just got a list of names right here. And just this quick, you know, two, three word prayer. Why, I, you know, why they need the prayer. Um and so what I what I've done is I got it with my stack here, got my uh, my Bible, my notebook, and uh, yeah, my prayer journal. So now I take notes while I'm reading, trying to get more intentional with that, and then uh, got the the prayer deal as well. So love it. You know, after I'm done reading and stuff, or at any point, freaking pop that sucker out, God. Sure. And then if I ever don't have it, I just throw it in there. God, I just. Pray for people on the prayer list. You know, my prayer <laughs> list. It's like a church. Like, Gosh. pray for people on the prayer list, God. <laughs> whatever, whatever the sheet says. Yeah, whatever the sheet says, God. I wrote it down. So, yeah, but I, I highly recommend, you know, I'm sure we're not alone. Somebody listening to this is like, man, that's me right now. I'm telling people I'll pray for them and then I'm not. So, Order yourself a pocket note. I went with the pocket just because, you know, you can really transport it a lot better than you can. Sure. Notebook. I can slip this thing about wherever. So, yeah, highly recommend. Uh, third part to this question, though, real quick, is what, what 
like someone's trying to cultivate a little bit more humility what give us an action item maybe one two three action items you feel have just been big in in the in the humility path hmm action items for humility and you mentioned it earlier that that biblical principle and i said it too um taking the lower seat i would I would say an easy place to start is just praying to God, like, all right, I want to start taking the lower seat. Please reveal to me in real time how I can go do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that when those situations arise, you'll see the opportunity to take the lower seat, um, whether that be, you know, not talking about yourself and letting the other person speak. Um, or even as simple as, you know, letting someone go in front of you to, to get a meal first when you're really hungry. I could give countless examples, yeah. um, but just asking God to reveal it to you. Man, it sounds like just a uh, heart posture of service um, seems to be the, the biggest yeah, thing. Um, absolutely. I, I think for me, like when you realize, like, like I have came from, I came a long way in my humility. <laughs> <laughs> Am I bragging about that? <laughs> Am I, I boastful about it? Yeah, um, you just canceled it out. But, but yeah, I mean, I really have though. Um, and so I think for me, it's it's been two just perspectives of like one, we're we're here to serve. Like we were placed here to serve others, and that's how you're gonna feel purpose and fulfillment. So that has been a big one. And I think number two, like God does not show favorites. It's like we're all equal in God's mm. eyes. Like you're trying to elevate yourself above someone else, like something's messed up you know you got a source problem something is astray there so yeah. no am i saying i'm perfect at that no absolutely not but i think that that's what humbles me a lot of like god sees that guy the same way i do so mm -hmm. or the same way he sees me so 100 percent. yeah oh man well i got a fourth question you got a fourth one we got a little bit of time here uh yeah let's rip it sure go ahead fourth question is what has God been teaching you in this season of life? Mm. <laughs> it's the number one thing. Man. Yesterday I felt like God was just freaking just on me about the the space and time that I'm wasting right now. Like, I feel like every season of life, <clears throat> what we do is we like, you know, oh, I don't have time. I'm super busy. Like life is demanding mm. business relationship, like all these relationships, like all this stuff, travel, like, you know, I'm like constantly like, Oh, I don't have time for stuff. And then, and then what happens is you progress to the next season. And then it's like, now I really don't have time. And it's like, so that meant I had time before, you know? So it's like when I was single, like and living in Florida, like it was, it was constantly like, it wasn't that I was saying I didn't have time. I understood, but it was something Mitch really was pouring into me. Like, Hey, you're single like, work on yourself. Continue pouring in, like use your time wisely. Essentially. Like once you get in a relationship, you will have far less time. And I've heard countless parents. Once you have kids, you, know, you will have far less time. And you mm -hmm. see it with people who, you know, you're kind of friends with who have kids. So yesterday I just felt like, man, I've just been justifying, like not having time, but I've been wasting so much. And so it's like, I felt like God was just like, like, what are you doing? Mm. Like, what are you doing with your time, man? Like justifying, you don't have time. You're wasting so much time. And then I also felt like God was just telling me um, that like, I, I just hit this like over this recent time, I just hit this like spurt of like, I need to continue expanding knowledge and network. Like I got that yesterday of like knowledge and network can never stop growing. And especially while I'm young, like right now, while I'm young, while I have the time, I need to be growing a foundation of knowledge, uh, a level of competency and as many things um, as I can. And, and, you know, depth of the things that I want to become elite at, let's say. So I felt like God was just telling me like, why have you stopped? being a student um and i even shared that with you over text yesterday like man i've been such a poor student it's like i stopped listening to the podcast as i was listening to i um 
stopped, you know, 75 hard. I was reading, but reading, I, I don't learn as much as I do from podcasts, which I'm going to continue to try to grow at as I know it's, it's important. But podcasts, I can get locked in and do I feel like I can recite the thing um, for some reason. Like I just can absorb it. So I felt like that those have been the two things. Like I need to be more intentional. I need to be all in on understanding the Bible and leveraging my time to grow closer to God. As cheesy and corny as that may sound right now in this podcast, but you know, I was just wasting a bunch of time. And then too, like I got to get back to being the student. Like I'm not at a place, and I'll never be at a place where my knowledge is enough. It has to continue to grow. Felt so, mm. like I just started. Like oh, I know enough. I need to go apply. And I don't think that is is a good frame. I feel like both have both are almost equally yoked. Your action and your education, they they are like propelling each other. Because as you're learning, you're growing. As you're growing, you're taking action. Like they, they both For are sure. kind of flowing. And, you, and I don't think you have enough time in your day to all action, no education. Like even yeah. if I were to say I know enough right now, I need to go take action. You can't just always be taking action. It's just not, it's not possible. It's not feasible. So there's always space to be educated. Does that make sense? For sure. Yeah. That's so so that's where I, I just got away from that. Uh, and dude, I just, I wasn't as hungry. And I, and I also think uh, it was, it was so funny because I, I turned on this podcast from Ed, my let, my guy yesterday. So funny because he's talking about how our thoughts are, he, I think he said two studies he found. One said 90% of our daily thoughts are repeated. I could believe it, yeah. He said, and then another one said 80%. So he said 90% are repetitious. I was like, oh my That's God. Crazy. And so if you're not educating, you're not challenging your current thoughts. You're just going to sit there in that loop of repetitious thoughts <laughs> and you're stuck. If you're not growing in your knowledge and your network, those two things challenge thoughts more than anything. I'd argue that network challenges thoughts more than anything. You meet someone who is, like you, who's making millions of dollars, it's like, oh my God, I could do that too. It challenges your thoughts. You meet someone who's like you, who's, you know, more devout in their faith. Oh my God, I could be doing more for God. Like, and so I think network really challenges your thoughts. So that was just a big thing that just hit me right out of the gate. Like, if 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 that's true, ninety percent of my thoughts are repetitious, which it makes total sense. And then he said, okay, let's look at the other ten percent. He said the ten percent of thoughts that aren't repetitious. It might just be what you're ordering from the restaurant. Yeah. They might not even be meaningful thoughts. They yeah. might be worthless thoughts. And I was like, that is me right now in this season. I'm on repeat <laughs> with 90% of my thoughts, unless I'm in the Bible. It's the only time I'm challenged with thoughts, which is good, but I'm not doing that enough. And 10% yeah. of my thoughts are just feeling like this meaningless decision making. And I was just like, this has got to stop. And that's when I... <laughs> I got on this whole rant about the whole phone thing. I was like, I'm done with this thing. I'm getting my peace back, getting my mindfulness back, back in on education. Yeah, so there's my rant, bro. Fire me up. Man, we've got three minutes. Let me hit All you a right. question. So over the last yeah, – I've talked about this before, but over the last, uh, you, I guess, like two years, let's say, year and a half, year, whatever. You know, you join Elevate 2022, I believe. Here we are now in 2024. So let's just say two years. Growth for you has been insane. It's been insane. And it just keeps going. So what has been the biggest catalyst to that? Like, why has growth just been, I mean, like, I feel like how much you've grown in the last year has been, like, compared to what people are going to do in 10 years. So, like, why? Um. I would say, number one, leaps Stress. of faith. <laughs> well, that, that, that was going to be my number two. <laughs> leaps of faith, okay, my bad. <laughs> number one would be leaps of faith. Um, just just taking those massive leaps, leaning on God. Maturity is bound to happen when you when you take those leaps. Um, you just you age so much, and you gain wisdom through those big decisions. Um, such as dropping out of college and coming on to elevate on the business side. And then I would say stress as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, from 
actually running a business to, you know, I mean, I wouldn't say this is a big one, but, you know, now leading a Bible study. I didn't do that before now, um, you know, leading 10 to 15 men every week to read the Bible, um, hosting events all around the country. Like, duh, <laughs> that's a lot of stress. Come on. But I would say between the, the big leaps of faith and the stress, yeah, the maturity and the growth is is imminent. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think that answers question one you had for me, you know, like I've taken those leaps of faith. Like the growth is inevitable when you know, you're about to take a big leap. It's scary. It's stressful. <laughs> you're two big yep. things, leaps of faith and stress. So it's like, those are the two biggest things I need for growth. Sounds like a winning formula. Might as well jump. Like, you know, that's another perspective to look at it. Um, so for me, growth, yeah. Though. Huh? Said so you got to love growth, though. Oh, man. Without growth, we got nothing. We got that. So um, let's wrap this thing up. I know we got to jump off. So I think we got to make this a regular regular thing where we bring about three cues. Um, I don't know, maybe call it just deep Q episode or something. Yeah. Uh, create a little podcast within the podcast. So, <laughs> yeah, we'll be back. Um, talking about money probably next or at least in the near future. I know I mentioned it last time, but money is coming. You can count on that. We got a little bit of travel coming up, so we haven't found the time or space. Um, Mitch is uh, going through some stuff in his personal life with his father-in-law's health. So we've been uh, trying to get something on the books, but you know, some other things take precedent in life um, to recording podcasts. So money will be coming. What the Bible says about money, a big series, in-depth series uh, will be coming on that. But as always, you know, drop a comment of what you want us to cover next. And yeah, appreciate you guys listening to Raw Faith episode whatever, episode question mark. Peace.